my first tip for you is if you simply pay attention to your body and look at what's happening, look at what's happening to your teeth, to your fingernails, your toenails, your skin, the quality of your hair for women are, they're more likely to notice they might be getting split ends or brittle hair or people's hair might be thinning. Uh, look at the smell of one's breath, which you can do by just taking your finger and swiping it across your tongue and smelling it. And most of my students are just dead shocked at what happens when they smell their own finger. <laughs> <laughs> when this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're going to see some serious shit. That is the story of human progress. One inch at a time. I'm your host, Joe DiStefano, and you're listening to Stack. In today's episode, I sit with Paul Check. Paul is an absolute legend in the holistic health and nutrition space. In fact, he was the first guy to do so many of the things that we quote biohackers are doing now from putting butter in coffee 10 years before anybody else to avoiding lights at night to avoid that suppression of your melatonin. Paul was a pioneer in so many of these things. In fact, he started doing them long before anyone had even thought of them and everyone thought he was totally crazy. <laughs> I remember when I first went to his workshop, which we talk about quite a bit on this show, my college professor was like, you're nuts. He's crazy. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't do this or he doesn't do that or he believes this. And lo and behold, over the next decade or so after that workshop, virtually every single thing I was taught not only became true for me, but became true for many, many, many coaches, trainers, and professionals in the space. In today's show, we chat, of course, about coffee. This is something that Paul and I both love espresso and starting the day that way, but he tells a story about how it was that he first put butter in coffee. It's a really interesting story. We talk about poop. We talk about sleep. Uh, we talk about how to see your health or vibrance or lack thereof in your body from, you know, why dark circles might appear to uh, a quick field test, like a two or three second test that you can do that'll actually let you know in real time how healthy whatever you're thinking about is, especially in the nutrition space. So in other words, if I'm thinking about eating A, B, or C, I can actually ask my soul uh, which one of them would be best for me and which one of them would be worst for me. And it's a pretty cool test that you can actually test out by testing things like uh, your name and saying your name and then saying someone else's name and, and watching what happens. We wrap up the show with a beginning of our conversation around the rotation diet, which I absolutely love. I first did it when I was in college. And we're going to save the bulk of that conversation for part two of this show. In truth, we had some audio issues. And so after about an hour, it just made sense to to cut this show off and get back on the phone a day or two and, and wrap it up. So part two will air very soon. As always, thank you guys so much for your ratings, reviews, listens, subscriptions, shares on social media. They really help this show grow and reach more people. And I think this episode with Paul Check is going to be an episode you're going to want to share around and, and send, send to loved ones and what big, chair just fell in the other room, uh, share with loved ones, friends, family, wherever, uh, cause Paul just offers so much positive energy and, and amazing information in this show. And finally, before we begin this amazing episode with Paul check a quick shout out to today's podcast partner, quick silver scientific. As many of you know, I am absolutely obsessed with this new product they created called immune charge. These are these little vials like at the grocery store when you're checking out and you're like, hey, you know, nail clippers, I maybe I should pick those up. When you're in that little area where there's all those random things, that's the type of product this is. It's these little shots that uh, come in a box of 12. Uh, but the only difference between things you might see in the grocery store aisle and 
immune charge is that it is probably a thousand times better for you and more bioavailable than anything you'll find in your grocery store. Uh, this is the absolute most potent immune booster that I know of on the market. In fact, it is shown to be a amazing first line of defense if you ever feel like you're getting sick. Uh, it's specifically targeted to respiratory health and avoiding colds and flus. And uh, it is a product that I've even got my mother taking right now. In fact, if you follow me on social media, I followed her kind of dosage. And what we did with her was we got her two boxes. She's going to take one per day for 10 days. And then based on how she feels, she'll either go two or three per week uh, for a couple of months. And then she might take some time off. And then when flu season kind of ramps up in October, November, uh, guess what? We're going to repeat the process. But if you're new to Immune Charge, it is very high doses of vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin A, E, and K, all wrapped up in the phospholipid technology from Quicksilver and elderberry so the delivery is incredible the um, the effect is immediate and it is my go-to so i would urge you guys to head on over to quicksilverscientific.com or click through via the show notes on coachjodi.com use code stacked at checkout if it is your first order and you're going to receive 15 percent off if it is a second, third, fourth, fifth, or 150th order, use code STACKED10 and you're still going to get a 10% discount. All right, guys. Now, without further ado, enjoy today's podcast with Paul Check. Hey, me neither. The sun's not, not out today over here in Luxembourg, so that's a little disappointing, but... Um, we're making the most of it. <laughs> it's here. It's out here. <laughs> oh my gosh! How's the new house? So killer, man! Unfriggin' yeah. believable. Yeah. So you're all you're all moved out of the heaven house. Oh yeah, that was done a long time ago. Uh, we started that. We've been going at it for three months. So yeah, we cleared out, cleaned it up, got gave the keys back, got our deposit back. We've moved out of the Vista house. We sold the Vista house. It's a uh, escrow will close in any day now, and we're still finishing the unpacking, but we're about 95% done. We've just got a bunch of stuff. We've got to figure out what the hell we're going to do with. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you were, in, you were in the other house for quite a while, right? You accumulated quite a bit of stuff. Yeah, we were in the Vista house for over 13 years. I was at the Heaven House for eight and Angie also had her whole house in storage. So oh we my merged gosh. three houses and three gyms. Yeah. Wow. And and your gym was no joke at the Heaven House. You should see it now. It's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Tell me about it. What do you got? What do you got going on over there? I've got everything that I had before, but I've got two Olympic platforms instead of one. Wow. And, um, I have a free motion cable machine that was in my gym at home uh, instead of the member at my heaven house. I had the big one outside and then the shorter one inside. Right. Yeah. So I got rid of the shorter one inside and put the free motion one, which is one. It's the original. It's actually the first free motion cable machine ever built. They gave it to me as a thank you for my consultation and support. And wow. uh, I don't know if you know it, but I'm the guy that invented the whole concept of uh move up moving cable arms adjustable heights and putting cable columns side by side so you could do bilateral movements wow yeah you know it now that you mention it i think i i did know that I, somewhere in the back of my head i had that information but now that you say it yeah, yeah. you used to yeah i think you used to uh have some a pulley system for sale on your website and um yeah, yeah we We've got, we're selling off the equipment we don't have room for, but mm. anyhow, I've got kettlebells, medicine balls, club bells, uh, you know, the whole gamut ropes, balance beams, plyometric boxes and hurdles and met, you know, piles of medicine balls and yeah. rebounder and enough to pretty much work with anybody right. at any level. Yeah, your your story of the of the free motion, the gift they gave you, it's reminiscent. I don't know if you know Elaine Lalane, Jack Lalane's wife. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. 
I, I, I know just by name. I think I've yeah. seen her on various videos with him. She's quite a beautiful, dark haired woman, right? She's amazing. Yeah. And she she was a guest speaker at an event that I put on a bunch of years ago and we ended up talking and she she says, you know, you got to come over. I've still got the original leg extension that Jack invented, the first ever leg extension machine in the garage. And uh, it's just like, oh, my God, I, I don't do too many leg extensions these days. But that would still be that's like, you know, that's the a fitness museum over there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so anywho, I, I would love to kind of, I really, you know, kind of had some more, I thought some more about what I wanted to chat about today on the show. And I think, you know, going by what I'm learning about my audience and, and what I want to give them, I really just want to take a dive into nutrition and some of the things like the rotation diet. And we'll talk about the, um, the, you know, the program I went through and, and some of the influence you've had on me. But I think what I'm seeing, it's really interesting. And I know you just had a podcast with Sire G who yeah, just Sayer. wrote, uh, Sayer, um, yeah. who just wrote G regenerate. And I just, yeah. I just started to think just how interesting it is, how, you know, the, the diet, um, that you need or that becomes popular or that everyone gravitates to is, is kind of the one that's solving the, the affliction that everyone's dealing with. Right. So in other words, when I read Sire, uh, Sayer's book, you know, the first thing is this apple diet where you go on a, a week or maybe it was just three or four days of just nothing but apples. And yeah. it's just, it's just so that pendulum is just swinging because myself included, you know, I talk a lot about intermittent fasting and I talk about low carb and I talk about fatty coffees. And, and so I think it's just interesting when we were, when we were really looking at blood sugar and we were looking at how do we extend life through that means, uh, all of a sudden we kind of just pushed fruit aside and now we're seeing, you know, everyone needs to get in touch with their soul and their self and start acting more consciously and, now food is information and not just calories and not just insulin and blood sugar is just, I just think it's so interesting how we, this pendulum swings. I'm the first guy to ever talk about food as information. So let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready whenever what was, you are. What was for breakfast today, Paul? Uh, I had chicken patties that are made of ground chicken and, and chicken liver. And I had spinach and I had... Um, Mexican beans, like like pinto beans. I'm not sure if they were pinto, but they were a bean like that with some organic hot sauce and some sea salt and some water. Terrific. No, no coffee on the side? I had a shot of espresso at about five o'clock this morning. All right. And when you when you do your coffee, and I know we have a, a history, a little history of coffee. It's a funny story we told when I was a guest on on your show. So when you have coffee, do you put butter in it? Do you put fat in it or you just take the shot? Well, you know, I'm the founder of that whole concept, at least in the West. I know you are. I remember way back in the day when I fir first took uh, HLC level one and I was, you know, butter in coffee was the most blasphemous. Just I had just had just finished my degree in exercise physiology and had a lot of conventional nutrition courses. And uh, butter was just, you know, that's going to give you heart disease and that's going to that'll kill you. And the thought of putting it into coffee is just, oh, my God gosh, you got to be out of your mind. And it was the one thing about that course. And I know I've mentioned this to you before, but it was, you know, it in many ways saved my life and completely redirected my career and my own journey. I mean, I was, when I finished my degree, I've never been, I could run farther than I can run today. I could, you know, I was fit as hell, but I was sicker than I've ever been and ever want to be back to. And when I took that course, everything seemed so opposite to what I had learned and, you know, everything from, from eating fat and working in and not just working out. And, you know, every year more and more of that workshop came true. And the funny thing is, is it's still coming true. And I find myself today after, you know, maybe, maybe kind of going down a few roads like fasting and getting involved with a lot of things, um, 
that, that, you know, I really found to be effective. I'm finding myself even today coming back to primal powder, pattern eating and using your techometer and getting people to buy how to eat, move and be healthy just because it's just this incredible timeless information that works. And even if you kind of hang your hat on something for a little while, it's, it's one of the most important books. And, and before I wrap and give you the ball back, I want to say one funny thing, my brother who is not overly into this stuff. Um, but I've got a copy of how to eat, move and be healthy at his house. Cause I've got a lot of my books there when I moved across the country. He sends me this picture the other day, and it's the um, it's the 4,000 years of medicine. Here, eat this root. No, yeah. don't eat that uh-huh. root. Eat, drink this yeah. potion. And he didn't even know that someone had sent him this screenshot. And I said, that's from How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, which you have upstairs in your guest room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So... So, Paul, yeah, so let's kind of dive in and and I would love to kind of hear about your, you know, nutritional philosophy. I'd love to chat about coffee and, and how you kind of original originally stumbled into this idea of putting fat into coffee, because I know that you were doing it longer than than just about anybody else. And then I would love to kind of just head into some rotational diets and some of the things that you do to kind of bring people back, because I think that um, nutrition is something that uh, everybody he's really into, but I think we lack, I think we do too many things as it relates to nutrition on purpose and not with purpose. So we wonder why it doesn't work. And we, we count the exact number of hours before we can eat or the exact number of calories. And we scratch our head and say, you know, why, why isn't I'm doing everything right? And I think there's a certain, I think you're a guy that can really empower people. And if in the next hour or so we can, we can kind of help people not only kind of see food for what it is, but, but also kind of be a little bit more connected with their soul and their inner self as it relates to the choices that they're making every single day. Yeah. Do you want to start with the coffee? Yeah, let's start with the coffee. Well, in the early 2000s, probably from around 2000 to, I don't know, 2002 or three, uh, somewhere right in there. Um, I can't remember the exact date. It's been a long time, but it's early 2000s. I, as I would be analyzing my patients' paperwork, their intake paperwork, which is extremely comprehensive, I have a health appraisal questionnaire that looks at uh, 29 organ systems and systems in the body, like the nervous system, the adrenals, the liver, uh, detoxification, immune, et cetera, musculoskeletal, uh, small intestine, large intestine. So it, it basically is a system of asking questions that pertain to each key system in the body And the questions basically let me know how many common indicators of dysfunction or disease are in that organ. So, for example, there's consistent signs. We all know if we have pain in the chest, particularly if it's radiating radiating down our left arm and we're short of breath, that's a very serious indication of a heart attack. So through all the years of medicine... Researchers cataloged the most common indicators of stress, dysfunction, or disease in any given gland, organ, or system in the body. And so my health appraisal questionnaire asks questions that if answered yes, and then it says, is it mild, moderate, or severe? So you might get two points, four points, or eight points. Gives me a, 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 a level of total stress on that system, which I can look at as indications of a, the need to look into that system and what's disrupting it. But B, I can calculate the total stress load, what I call total physiological load on a person's body. And the questionnaire also looks at key emotions as well. And I saw over and over and over again, that almost every single person that came to me was a drinking coffee on an empty stomach in the morning and was having severe uh, dysregulation of their blood sugar. So in the evaluation, it looks like it looks at high blood sugar indicators and low blood sugar indicators. And what my evaluation showed is that most people were oscillating back and forth all day long from high to low blood sugar, which is a fantastic formula to bring on uh, type two diabetes. 
So <laughs> the long story of, of that one is, is that getting people to change their behavior with regard to drinking coffee is not easy to do because <laughs> a it's a very strong addiction and b it's a very deeply ingrained cultural habit and c a cup of coffee or more cups of coffee in the morning is probably one of the most common psychological anchors for people in the world today especially the industrialized world and so having worked with countless uh, patients trying to, you know, get them off a of coffee and seeing all the resistance and telling them, look, you just need to eat some food with your coffee because then the coffee gets tied up in the fats and the proteins. And then it is slowly diffused into the system through the digestive mechanism. And it will stop you from having this rapid es escalation of blood sugar, which comes with ad adrenaline and cortisol, followed later by a rapid drop, which the problem is when the drop comes, people feel very hungry. And the, as you know, when people are low blood sugar, they get very moody, edgy, and hard to be around and even <laughs> challenging for themselves. So I was telling them, all you got to do is eat. But uh, the, the, one of the challenges was so many of these people that were, were having this problem were females, most, most of them mothers, and a lot of them single mothers. So they were in such a rush all the time, and they had mm. so much silliness in their head about diet and so many of them were starving themselves because they were gaining weight and trying to lose weight so they're the kind of the cultural norm for a lot of these people is just to skip breakfast and wait till lunch as part of their calorie reduction program and it was coupled with being in too much of a hurry so i started meditating and asking my soul to give me guidance on what would be a simple effective solution and at the time, I just happened to be studying the science of chelation and how vitamins are chelated to create time-release vitamins. And as I was reading, it just dawned on me, wow, all I've got to do is chelate coffee. And so the next thought was, well, people naturally like to put milk and cream in their coffee, but I got to kind find something that won't trigger off dairy intolerance because that's one of the most common intolerances in the world. And so I immediately knew butter was going to be the answer because butter has such a small amount of protein in it that many people that are dairy intolerant and can't ha cannot handle milk solids can handle butter. So I began taking uh, organic butter and just stirring it into my, I would melt it first just so it didn't chill the coffee because I only drink espressos, not coffee. And I put it in there and I noticed immediately that I could go to the gym and that I had a much smoother experience of being lifted by the espresso before that I was, you know, drinking a couple shots of espresso before I'd go do really intense training. And back in those days I was training extremely hard and I would come up, but probably about three quarters of the way through the workout, all I could think of is, man, I got to get out of here and get to some food. And I feel like I need another shot of espresso. I could feel that I was crashing. But once I started putting the butter in there, I felt a much smoother up and a much smoother down. And I also could feel that if I had it on empty stomach, I didn't feel that deep sense of emptiness of when you're hungry in the morning because there was actually a food source in there. But I found, even, you know, because you know, I work mostly with people that are having a lot of health challenges um, at that time, particularly now, I get them from every walk of life you can imagine from, you know, spiritual crisis to crisis from using too much psychedelics and fracturing their psyche to uh, midlife crisis to divorce to inability to recover from death in the family. So my practice is very diverse. But back in those days, people were very caught in this low fat concept i mean just addicted like you were when you got out of university and for the same reasons they were falsely educated for reasons of profit but um so what i realized is that so many of them were dairy intolerant and even were still getting some mild reactions from the butter so i started testing all sorts of other oils every kind of nut oil you could think of coconut oil and once I had the idea come to me, I hired a professional librarian to do a worldwide literature search 
And I thought, I wonder if anybody else has thought of this or if I'm the first one. And she could find not a single stitch of research looking at the use of fat sources of any type with coffee for any reason. But she did find an article or two about Tibetans putting uh, yak butter in their mm -hmm. tea. And so I went, aha, the Tibetan culture is on to this. But I'd never in my entire career heard anybody mention it. And in our culture, it would have been, you know, a sin because everybody was in the same mindset you had when you came to HLC1. So what happened was I tested it and tested it and I've never stopped using it, turned all sorts of people on it. But it really got popular when I turned Laird Hamilton on to it in about 2005 when he started working with me as a therapist and conditioning specialist for him. And he then talked about it on various interviews. And then I think uh, Dave Asbury picked it up from Laird and that became the kind of the part of the concept of bulletproof coffee. But Dave Asbury didn't even know that I was the founder of that idea. <laughs> um, and, and very few people do, but it was nice to hear both Gabrielle and Laird on um, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, Joe, um, What's the famous podcaster in LA? Rogan. Joe Rogan. Sorry, I was just brain farting. Uh, <laughs> both Gabby, she was did an interview with him on Joe Rogan's, and she said actually Paul's the source of that idea, and then Laird actually told him as well. But I was glad to hear that because so many people actually think I'm BSing them when I tell them that I, I the founder of that idea. They think I'm just trying to you know. <laughs> get attention or something but it's actual fact uh, <laughs> along with many other ideas <laughs> hey guys sorry to interrupt today's podcast with paul check i hope you're digging it please don't forget to share it around rate review subscribe i really hope you're enjoying it anyway real quick wanted to tell you about another one of my favorite products keon aminos keon aminos are my go-to product for exercise recovery for focus and productivity and kind of mental stability uh, because all of your positive neurotransmitters are also created from these amino acids it's also my go-to fasting companion so if you want to fast and maintain muscle mass which so many people do just five or ten grams of aminos throughout the day can help you do that they are an extremely versatile product for my friends at get keon.com that's g-e-t-k-i-o-n.com slash stacked there you're going to find my favorite product keon aminos but you're also going to find some of my other favorite products like keon flex or keon coffee or creatine or oregano oil just about anything you'll find on that page i would highly recommend and you guys can save a whole bunch on your first order at getkeon.com with code STACKED. Just head on over to getkeon.com slash STACKED. Check out the products, throw the ones in your cart that you really like. And if it's your first order, type in that code and save up to 20%. All right, guys, back to the show with Mr. Paul Check. It's the first one who tries to sell it, Paul. It's not the one, the first one that does it. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. It's a funny story. It's similar to the Dan John, you know, uh, Dan John has come up with so many amazing exercises for different types of therapies and, and activating muscles and things. And now he's naming his exercises, just completely obscure things like, you know, this is the, this is the goat bag, uh, lunge. And, you know, you just hold the dumbbell in a certain way or what have you, just so he knows his stamp is, on, his stamp is on it and pumps the videos out and things like that. Um, and, and that's the thing, though, Paul, with, with your work and how to eat, move and be healthy and, and everything that I learned, because when I came in, uh, there was so much there that uh, I maybe didn't, quote, believe in at the time. And I remember when, uh, you know, I, the, the instructor said, you know, uh, you should not have electronics in your bedroom while you're sleeping. And it was just this like, oh, my gosh, these guys are crazy. And then a couple of years later, guess what? I'm duct taping my hotel rooms, you know, all the different electronics at the hotel room and, and the blinds closed. So so many of the things that we do now, you know, I've I've noticed for sure that you've been doing for quite a while, which is 
one of the reasons I wanted to kind of bring you on the show and, and really kind of help people discern, because I think this next wave of nutrition that we're going to see, you know, we just went through the keto thing and we just went through the fasting thing and the bulletproof thing, which I, you know, that's all kind of one big thing maybe. Uh, but I think now we're all kind of, especially with the state of the world, we're all trying to become the most in tune humans that we can possibly be and the most healthy inside and out. And I think that we're going to see a lot of need for recovering from too much fasting, too much fat, too much of these types of things, and maybe too much exercise is another common thing that, that I see. And so I would love to kind of dive into some of the methods that you use if someone has, you know, fasted a little bit too much and, and skipped too many meals, because I think that's something I'm seeing a lot right now. Well, for those that are really interested, uh, my primal pattern eating online course is eight hours of training cut directly out of my professional training program, Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2, which goes into much greater detail, as you can imagine, with an eight-hour course than we can do on a short podcast like this. But I'll give an overview. The first thing is that all the different approaches you just described are actually ideas. Do you understand that point? Mm -hmm. They're ideas. They're not realities. Right. They're ideas. The idea of fasting, the idea of eating a lot of fat or a keto diet, the idea of veganism or vegetarianism, the idea of nose to tail eating, the idea of uh, the South Beach diet, the idea of the uh, Pritikin diet, the, the, or the Ornish diet. Those are all just ideas. And they're usually ideas that came to people that helped them when they had some kind of a challenge, be it an illness or a need to lose weight or uh, gain muscle or something like that, get over an illness. But the key factor is, is that one man's medicine is another man's poison. And what works for you today may actually be stressful for you tomorrow. So some very simple things that I teach my patients. Now, when people come to professional training, I teach them how to track these symptoms very carefully to the uh, source. So, for example, many people wake up with uh, bags under their eyes, which is a symptom that the kidney system is under too much load. So for example, someone who has a dairy intolerance and doesn't know it, but ate ice cream before bed or anything with milk in it is likely to wake up in the morning with puffy eyes because the kidneys filtration system gets clogged up with antibodies um, that the immune, or excuse me, antigens, chunks of undigested dairy that the immune system then has to come and police out, which is an inflammatory process. And so that basically is like having a clogged filtration system, like a clogged filter in the, in a, in the fuel delivery system of car will shut the engine down. And, and so you see all this puffiness. Another common sign is dark circles under the eyes, which are called allergic shiners, which is a clear indication that the liver itself is backed up and is unable to clean the blood effectively and because the capillary beds are so close to the surface under your eyes you can easily see the discoloration of the blood when we look at a body when we look at our body in the mirror in the morning if we're under too much stress it overloads us it, our adrenal system and it pushes our cortisol levels up to try to adapt to the stress but one of the most common reactions to chronic elevated cortisol, for example, is an increase in the fat around the belly button. It's not actually fat. It looks like fat, but the, when the body's under stress, it starts holding water because it believes it's in a fight or flight situation and has no idea when food or water is going to be available. So whenever your cortisol levels rise up, which means the kidney and adrenal, uh, kidney and adrenal system are under a lot of stress, you start seeing the accumulation of water in the body, but it looks like fat and it starts at the belly button and radiates outward through the body. And most people today, for example, I had two guys deliver furniture to me this morning and both of them were severely swollen and very distended guts. And one of them had 
brown spots that look like sunspots all over his legs, almost like he'd been bitten by thousands of mosquitoes, and some of them were scabbing and coming off, which is a classic symptom of a fungal infection. So as a tip, I gave him each a copy of How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. So my first tip for you is if you simply pay attention to your body and look at what's happening, look at what's happening to your teeth, to your fingernails, your toenails, your skin, the quality of your hair for women, are, they're more likely to notice they might be getting split ends or brittle hair or people's hair might be thinning. Uh, look at the smell of one's breath, which you can do by just taking your finger and swiping it across your tongue and smelling it. And most of my students are just dead shocked at what happens when they smell their own finger. <laughs> <laughs> I always say, you think you're shocked. Talk to the person that kissed you this morning. Um, <laughs> um, so we can look at uh, our aches and pains in our body. We can look at our frequency of urination, the color and the smell of the urination. As I show on how to eat, move and be healthy, you can look at your poops. And as you know from the book, I have a whole chart in there describing each of the common dysfunctional poops and what is the common reason that that happens and when you know what a healthy poop's supposed to look like, smell like, and behave like, and how it's supposed to feel when you pass it, if you're not getting that, you immediately have a very reliable indicator of how much stress the body's under. For example, as we go too sympathetic or fight or flight, it tends to cause too much contraction in the small intestine, and many people hold their stress in their guts. So they start having things like pencil poops, or uh, if they're not getting enough water, they have what I call pellet poops that look like deer poop or rabbit poop all squished together. If they're eating too much powders and protein powders and shakes and they're not getting enough water, they get what I call bodybuilder poops, which are very hard to pass compressed things that look like they've been squashed down by a press or something. So looking at your poops is a very, very in important indication, smelling them and watching whether or not they're floating or sinking. If they're not floating, it means you're low on fiber. Your, your diet's too dense and you don't have enough fiber to keep the body clean and absorb toxins. If they're floating and they won't flush down and they turn a light gray or a whitish color, it means you're eating more fat than your liver gallbladder system can break down. It means you may have a problem producing bile. And those are the ones I call the Olympic swimmers because no matter how many times you flush the toilet, they don't want to go down because there's so much fat in them, they float on top of the water. So then you can look at things like your breathing. Is your breathing labored? Is it shallow? Are you suffering from chronic muscle tension in places like your neck, shoulders, face, and jaw? Those are indicators of too much stress because the reticular activating system and limbic system dump any excess electrical activity in the brain first into the masseter uh, sternocleidomastoid and upper trapezius and levator scapula muscle, which is based on the work of a medical doctor named Arsevere Arat, who did this research for his medical thesis, doctor, his thesis in medical school in 1972. So without being more exhaustive than that, your first tip is pay attention to what your body's telling you. And whenever you have negative symptoms, ask yourself this simple question. What am I eating the most of? For most people, it's eggs or nuts or grains or cereals made of grains. Those are the most common offenders. The most common offenders in every culture are the foods eaten most. For example, if you go to Japan or China, the most high rate of intolerance is to rice. So, if you start removing the foods you eat the most from the diet, which are usually the ones people are most addicted to, unfortunately, one, you'll usually notice your body symptoms changing quite quickly if it's related to that food and it takes 72 hours to clear something. It's, when you eat a food, it takes 72 hours to go from mouth to anus in a healthy body. So within 72 hours, by the fourth day, you should notice significant changes. Some people will notice them right away, like, within 12 to 20 hours, like all of a sudden brain fog goes away. So the other thing is if you 
Clear the food you eat most and you don't notice a change and ask yourself, what have you eaten differently lately? So, for example, if you went out to dinner last night with some friends and had mud pie, but you don't normally eat mud pie for dessert, then you have to say, okay, what's in the mud pie? Well, it's got nuts in it. It's got caramel in it. It's loaded with sugar. It's got chocolate in it. And it often has a crust with gluten in it. So whichever one of those is the least common thing you eat, becomes the new drug that you've been exposed to and therefore you have to say okay if this is a one if this just happened and it hasn't happened very often well then next time i go out i better not eat mud pie or anything with those key ingredients if i do then i can pay attention and do another research project and lo and behold if i wake up the next morning with swollen puffy eyes I know there's something in that mud pie and I better start investigating or I'm going to end up being a sick person going to doctors to ask me for help with diet advice, which is like um, going to a rocket scientist to learn how to eat. (laughs) So just paying attention. Now, the next level that we can all use is muscle testing. And I teach in my course, um, a common muscle test that's easy to use called the duckbill muscle test. There's other ones like making a ring out of your thumb and index finger with your non-dominant hand and putting your index finger in the loop and trying to break the loop. So you then ask a question to your body such as, is coffee stressing our body to the point that we need to reduce it? And if you can pull your finger through the loop easily, it means you've gone weak. It means, yes, you're under stress. But if you pull and you really have a very hard time breaking the loop, it means you're strong. So whenever the body says yes, it brings the body into coherence and therefore systems integrate and work better. But whenever the body's in dissonance, it weakens the body. And the way I prove this to my students is very simple. I say, okay, state your name out loud, your age and and the date you were born, and then say to yourself, ask the question, is it true, dear body, that this is my name and I was born on this day? And muscle test yourself. I've never had anybody test weak. Then I say, now tell a lie. (laughs) Use your mother's name or somebody else's name and make up a date and say, My name is Susie Smith, and I was born uh, September the 2nd, uh, 2010. And muscle test yourself. I've never seen anybody that didn't test weak. The reason that is, by the way, is because whenever we tell a lie, it creates incoherence and decreases our chance of survival. Because when we lived in nature, we depended upon each other for our survival. So if everybody was starving and and somebody wandering on a different trail found a bunch of bananas and hid them and ate a bunch of them and was going to go back and eat them by themselves and everybody else in the tribe said, where have you been? Did you find any food? And they said no. They would actually be decreasing their own survival because even though they might last a couple more days on the bananas, there won't be enough people to protect them or to create shelter or to do the things that we each specialize in in any tribal society. So ultimately telling a lie decreases our chances of survival, which creates incoherence and weakness in the body, which is a tip for people in the habit of telling lies. It'll make you weak and it'll make you sick. So muscle testing is a very useful one. Soul connections really more than I want to get into on a podcast because it requires more focus and a little more specific guidance and shouldn't be rushed. But in essence, soul means consciousness within. So your inner thoughts, your inner feelings, your entire inner existence through which you experience all thoughts, words, and actions is the domain of the soul. Soul is the feminine receptive principle. Spirit is the masculine principle and spirit means the flow of energy and information. So your soul is experiencing your thoughts, which are energy and information. Your soul is listening to me talk right now. It's receiving energy and information, and it records that and allows you to feel that. 
certainly you've had the experience of someone telling you a lie. What happens inside of you, Joe, when you know you're being lied to? You you don't feel very good. You just you have that sense of of uh, just uneasiness and angst. Uh, you and, feel out of alignment, don't you? Yeah, out of alignment. That's why the Aboriginal peoples have a saying. If a man's mind and body do not stand in the same place, he is crooked. So whenever your mind is out of congruence with the wisdom of your subconscious mind and your unconscious mind, which is a million times more powerful than your conscious mind, you will feel disjointed, heavy labored, uh, almost like a feeling of sadness or disappointment comes over you. Hmm. And that is the exact experience you will have inside if you just empty yourself of your own thoughts, focus your attention on the banana, the coffee, the cookie, whatever it is, and muscle test yourself. Is this good for us to eat right now? And the answer is going to be yes, strong or no weak. Or a simple tip that anybody can use, which requires that you be brave enough to stop thinking, which is hard to do when you have an addiction because you're afraid to hear no. So true eating with the wisdom of the consciousness and intelligence within us requires tremendous spiritual courage because you have to be willing to hear no to something that you're addicted to or think you can't do without. And interestingly, Joseph Campbell says, if you want to know who your God is, ask yourself what you cannot do without for two or three days and you've met your God. And most people are being ruled by their food addictions. So when you simply take a piece of food and just put your awareness on it. I recommend people hold it in their left hand, which is the feminine hand. And our palms have very strong chakra centers in them because that's what we use to feel, especially when we're parenting children that can't speak yet. We'll often touch them if they're upset and we'll not consciously often realize, but we're connecting to them to feel what happens inside of us. So we go into an empathetic state. So if we take the food item and put it in our left hand or just touch it, the energy field of the food will interface with our energy field and we can just simply pay attention what's happening inside me that's different when I hold the food versus when I let go of it what happens inside me when I simply think the thought so Joe right now try just emptying your head and think the thought I'm going to drink a big gulp that has a quarter, a cup and a quarter of sugar in it and pay attention to what happens when you imagine yourself drinking that. <laughs> Got a headache. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to me is I get nervous and anxious and I start to buzz. I feel insecure. Like someone just asked me to stand naked on stage. Yeah. And I, and I'm like, Oh God, do I really want to do that? So you see, your soul is what's giving you the capacity to feel the response to the spirit, which is the request, should I eat this food? But most people are so caught in their head, which is a serious problem in worldwide today. We're caught in the mental structure of consciousness, but we avoid the archaic structure, which is the fusion with the minerals of the earth and the earth itself. We avoid the magic structure, which is the fusion with biological life. We avoid the mythical structure, which is the fusion with the truth of our own story or the, or the lack thereof. And we live in the mental consciousness, which is really the belief that ideas are real. But the question is not whether an idea or, is real. The question is whether the idea is symbiotic with your needs at any given moment in your life, which can change from day to day. Absolutely. It reminds me of uh, Britta Bushnell. You know, she's got a, a book called Transform by Birth. That, and we went through her workshop and things before we had our baby. And uh, she talks about just how Apollonian the world has become and how birth is very Artemisian. And I, I guess these Greek gods were siblings and they're kind of opposites and they represent, you know, logic and, and, you know, neat corners and straight lines. And, uh, and then what's, you know, what's more natural and what can't be put in a box and that's reality. So how do we, it's, in this, this is something I've, I could, go ahead. I just want to interject real quick. <laughs> it's funny. You mentioned that. 
because I just interviewed Zach Bush for 90 minutes yesterday. You know who Zach Bush is? MD? Terrific. Just yeah. unbelievable man. And so a big part, I asked him to share with us how it is that he became the man he became. What was his uh, developmental pathway and his education pathway? And one of the most profound influences on him that really taught him when he became a medical doctor, how completely off the birthing process was as he, his aunt brought him to um, the Philippines and she worked with midwives and he spent quite some time working with midwives over there. And that's where he got his introduction to real birthing and healthcare and what the process of life and birthing was all about. And then because he was so inspired by it, he went for an OBGYN rotation and he was dead shocked at what he saw. And he describes his first experience in a birthing process. And it's pretty, pretty sad. And it's exactly what you're describing. Yeah, you know, it is, you know, having just we had a hospital birth and, you know, when we were in L.A. Uh, before lockdown and all the craziness, we had a midwife and a doula and, you know, the whole thing to do a home birth. And we did when we decided to come to Europe for the six months or so with this covid thing and have the baby in a hospital here because you're actually not allowed to have a home birth for your first child here, which is kind of funny. But um, everything is is seemingly very backwards as it relates to nature and also just, uh, you know, just almost everything I had a sort of, uh, point to raise about or a question about, or why are we doing this? And do we have any alternatives? And, uh, do we have to put that near her, <laughs> you know, and it was, yeah. uh, it was just the most, you know, having, and that was one of the beautiful things about the workshop we went to with Britta, just cause she prepared us for that. You know, she kind of prepared us for this very, what she called Apollonian, very, very sort of, uh, you know, bright lights and white walls, uh, when it should be a dark cave and, <laughs> and a cool breeze, you know? So, um, uh, we were we were somewhat prepared for it, but it is really mind blowing. And I'll I'll share a quick story. It's just this, you know, with with Amelia, they were just checking on her, and they kept trying to spray her with this highly toxic uh, stuff that basically allowed them because she ended up taking some painkillers after 15 hours of labor. Uh, she ended up um, getting an epidural, and so they had to check her um, sensation and feeling, and and what they used instead of just like holding an ice cube on her. Her. They would actually spray her with this propane based uh, fuel, whatever the heck it was, to see if she could feel cold. And I just every time they pulled this can out, I basically leaped out in front of them like, get that away. Like, you know, if you have to use it, put it on a towel and just like barely touch her with it. But do not spray her. She's, you know, bur it was just madness, Paul. But, you know, so what do, what are we to do, Paul, when we're when we're living in this world that at times is is not only backwards, but just so far beyond that for the for the worse, for the negative. It's like we're, you know, speaking of kind of being out of alignment. And, and then the next part of that would be how do you help somebody that is just locked in this constructive world where where everything you know nets out to zero and everything adds up and everything is in a white you know a perfect box and and everything has a reason and a purpose that's that's you know for some other benefit that leads to something else what do you how do you bring people back to to being human <laughs> well the honest truth is you wait till they're in enough pain to listen <laughs> That's what I call the pain teacher. Otherwise, you'll just be an irritation to them, especially if they're family members. But I have an approach that I develop called surrounding the dragon. And surrounding the dragon is a concept I developed that means whenever you're facing a significant challenge or something that's so complex, you can't really get to the roots of it then surround the dragon by doing everything you possibly can do to enhance the body's own resources and vitality so that it has the resources to solve the complex problem itself. Because the truth is the body can heal almost anything if you give it the resources it needs and or do the things it needs, such as sleeping or breathing properly or moving properly or uh, you know stretching or mobilizing or whatever it might be. The body always tells you through your instincts and your intuition 
what it needs. You know, I doubt anybody with a body can sit in a chair in one position for very long before all of a sudden their body says, move your butt, move your back. Uh, nobody can stand perfectly ramrod still on their feet. If they do, they'll pass out. I've seen it happen many times in military formations. And so the body tells you when to move to protect itself. But we have stopped listening to our body and we've gotten addicted to listening to people in white jackets, be they scientists or medical doctors, which are our modern extensions of the religious priesthood. And we've been so conditioning, conditioned to believe in authority figures above and beyond our own inner experience and our own opinions that we get trapped in not realizing that most of what's being pawned off to us as science and medicine today is really a system that's designed for profit to keep you in this system and to create as many problems as it takes away so that you have to keep coming back. It's a disease maintenance system, and it is uh, its only means of survival is the perpetuation of illness and disease. Otherwise, Donald Trump wouldn't have created a $2 trillion bailout for coronavirus. He would have spent $2 trillion on educating people on how to eat, move, and know the basics of taking care of a healthy body. Yet, interestingly enough, I think it was during the either the Bush or the Reagan administration when C. Everett Koop was the Surgeon General of the United States, I just happened to catch – a public address by him and he was concerned the fact that the top 10 killers in the United States were all lifestyle related directly to lifestyle issues and he said to the American public if you would just pay more attention to your diet and your lifestyle you would not have these problems they fired him the next day for saying that oh my gosh it will he well, got let's hope attacked he didn't. He got attacked yeah. by doctors all over the country saying, you do not have the power to tell people that just changing their diet and lifestyle will get rid of those diseases. That is not your job. <laughs> Yet here he is, the Surgeon General. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the crazy thing was he was probably pointing at the old school food pyramid that we know, <laughs> you know, that even that was a, you know, an improvement to what to what we were doing. Yes. Yeah, so. Surrounding the dragon means you need to start with what I teach in holistic lifestyle coaching as the six foundation principles, because those are the things that build the foundation of health for anybody. So there's three feminine and three masculine. The three feminine are nutrition, hydration, and sleep. Those are all multipliers of energy if you do them correctly. And the three masculine, yang, are dividers of energy. Yang, by definition, means to divide energy, and that's breathing thinking and movement when we breathe we distribute the energy to every system and every cell in our body so every breath is divided by about 100 trillion cells and many organ and gland and muscle systems when we think we divide our consciousness if you're in a state of deep meditative awareness you can be fused with everything at once which is called a no mind experience or prajna you're in a state of witnessing or intuition um so thinking divides our energies and movement divides our energies. As soon as we get up and start moving, we still have to run all our other biological systems, but now we also have to expend energy on something else. So the sympathetic system is linked to the masculine aspects, yang, and those are all what I call the working out systems because all those activities uh, if you do any activity classified as working out, it costs you more energy per unit of time than it delivers. But all the yin principle is parasympathetic, linked to the parasympathetic system. And that's what I call working in. And any foods or hydration approaches or resting approaches that are yin will multiply energy in the body. So most people, even though... Nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement can all be very out of balance. We'll get far more benefit to start on the yin side because those magnify power. And sleep is the easiest to change for anybody. So drinking more water is easy to change. But changing your diet can be tricky because of all the addictive qualities and chemical addictions and 
you know, all the tricks they play with food and, 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 and beliefs that this diet will do this for me without <laughs> paying attention to the fact that since you've been on the diet, it hasn't usually been doing what you thought it would do, or it's done it for a while. And all of a sudden it's not working anymore. But the point being is the fastest place to begin healing anything is with sleep and quality water and hydrating yourself effectively which in my book i teach the average person should drink half their body weight in ounces of water a day or their weight in kilograms times 0 0.033 to give you the amount of liters a day per body weight and that's just a, a good starting point for almost everybody so if you start with Paying attention to nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, and thinking and movement. 99% of the time, when you balance those out, your problems will have either disappeared or be making such noticeable changes you know you're on the right track. And after three to six months of that, if there's still problems left over, that's when I suggest people uh, let me do functional medicine tests on them to determine what blocking factors may be involved, such as mercury, uh, heavy metals in general, uh, fungal infection, parasite infection, uh, a disease process that may be uh, disturbing their homeostasis, um, and any number of, there's a long laundry list of things that it could be. But typically, if people eat the right foods and rest their body effectively and hydrate effectively, one, they're going to find that eating a lot more variety. I tell people, use the same technique when you go to the store. And instead of eating the same foods over and over again, and research shows that the average person only eats 12 foods their entire lifetime. And I found another research paper that said the average person only knows 12 exercises. So there's an interesting parallel. <laughs> but if you go to the store, instead of having an idea about what you should be eating, just go stand in front of all the vegetables, look at them. Look at the carrots and muscle test. Do we need carrots? Yes or no? Yes. Do we need broccoli? Yes or no? No. Do we need eggplant? Yes or no? Yes. And if you do that for everything, a lot of people come back to me and go, my God, Paul, I've got all these weird vegetables I've never even eaten before. I don't even know how to cook them. What do I do? I said, well, you got to go get a recipe book. Well, what about this Mediterranean spinach? Just search, search. Uh, how to cook Mediterranean spinach on the internet. <laughs> 28 milliseconds, you'll have the answer. And lo and behold, they say things like, oh my God, I went to the fish counter and did that and my body wanted me to eat sea urchin. That grosses me out. I say, well, good. Think of how many people go to chemo and radiation therapy and almost die and have their hair fall out and end up burned and lose body parts. So what do you want to do? Eat some sea urchin or wait till you have to get shit cut out? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, and, and yeah, you know, it's funny because I've been, you know, really pushing people towards sardines lately just because it's so convenient and so nutritious. And, and it mm -hmm. is like people just have it's that it's you might as well tell them to eat a sea urchin when it comes to sardines. Well, that's the result of programming. Um, and what are you seeing there? You're seeing that the mind is far more powerful than the instincts of the body and the needs of the body or the ability for a person to listen to their unconscious mind because they have not lived in their body. They're living in their head. So their body just becomes kind of like the case on your iPhone. And when it gets all beat up and trashy looking, you just replace it and buy another one. But in this case, you can't just replace your body and buy another one. And most people's bodies are beat up and trashy because they're only paying attention to what's on their iPhone, not what they're doing to their case iphone here meaning their mind right right and you know it's funny i'm still sitting here with my index finger and thumb together pulling on it thinking of stuff listening to what you're saying so when we when we head back to nutrition and i think that trick that you just taught us a little while ago is something that people can use and it creates a an undeniable kind of uh piece of evidence right this undeniable connection with our with our soul that this is a good decision or this is not a good decision when this works now another thing and i i mentioned in the start of the show i wanted to kind of dive into that routine rotation diet you created as well. It's something that I used. I, I used it in college um, or soon after I went to your course. And it was so great because basically what I would do is I would cook dinner 
and I would make enough for breakfast and lunch the next day. So I'd have the same thing, dinner, breakfast, lunch, and then cook again, dinner, breakfast, lunch. And that was my cycle. Um, now when we go into this, I think it's another piece of the puzzle where, you know, somebody doesn't want to believe or doesn't believe or hasn't really, it hasn't triggered their mind that, you know, almonds are the problem or eggs are the problem, right? Because it's this food that's undeniably healthy and I've been eating it a long time, et cetera. Now the rotation diet, it creates this thing where, you know, you stop eating almonds for four days and, and all of a sudden you feel a lot more energetic. You feel a little bit better. Your digestion, your digestion figured itself out. So can you help us, Paul, kind of dive into the thought behind the rotation diet and also kind of how you categorized the different foods? Um, and you know, what, what kind of put each food in each category in other words? Yeah. Uh, first, before I dive into that, I'll just make a point here that I think is extremely important. The practice I just gave on how to eat, particularly with muscle testing and soul connection, but paying attention to symptoms as well, actually is a legitimate spiritual practice. People go to churches, temples, and synagogues and breathing workshops all day long, but they come to me with all sorts of problems. And they can do all sorts of fancy breathing and, and prayers and, and spiritual rituals and whatever, but they're still doing it all from the mental level of themselves. But as we authentically engage our soul and our body with the honest intention to get healthy, we repeatedly have to touch base with our unconscious, with our soul, which is also unified with our superconscious. So we actually get to the point over time, and not only do we notice we look better, we feel better, we have more vitality, more mental clarity, we recover faster from exercise, we're not nearly as emotionally unstable, but we begin to realize I can use that same approach to deciding which airline route is going to be the quickest or um, which of my tasks on the list of 20 that I should do today because of the most important Although they all seem just as important to me, I can ask that deeper part of myself. I can decide whether or not I should get married with someone because maybe they look good, but they're good in bed. But something inside me is out of alignment. And now I have a reason to sit quietly and start asking deeper questions and listen honestly for the answers. So what I've taught my students is that the very practice I teach them on how to get healthy actually is one of the most critical spiritual practices because you can use that very same set of pathways to connection to the soul to get guidance on literally every aspect of your life. So I just wanted to make sure people realize this is far deeper than just an eating practice. It's actually legitimate spiritual growth, which is ultimately what religion is for. Now the four day rotation diet, um, Probably in about 89, I began studying the literature that was available on food allergy and food intolerance because I uh, started and, and was part of a multidisciplinary group of doctors and therapists that I hand selected from all over San Diego County that were experts. And I did it so that we could each get together and learn from each other. And we would each bring a tough case that we had that wasn't responding effectively and we would share the evidence with everybody in the group. And then we would discuss what their approach would be and what kept coming up with some of these more elite doctors and therapists was that they had identified research and then known through clinical correlation that food intolerance and food allergy was causing a lot of the problems that were leading to disease states and health challenges that were getting treated by drugs and surgery and all sorts of other stuff. And one of my friends, Dr. Oliver, who is actually uh, one of the he's the doctor that helped me put the whole holistic lifestyle coach program together, turned me on to a book called Clinical Ecology by Lawrence Dickey, MD, which in, it was published in 72. But it was the most authoritative collection of scientific research on food allergy and food intolerance that I've ever seen. And it took me about six months to read it. Uh, carrying it all over the world in airplanes. And when it was published, the American Medical Association tried to take his medical license away, and they actually tried to get the government to ban the book because the book showed through scientific evidence that almost everything people were coming to hospitals for was the result of food reactions, and they did not want that getting into the public. 
in the book, he showed a taxonomic tree to show where all foods come from in nature, all the way from the top of the food chain right back to the very base of the taxonomic tree. And our entire taxonomic tree begins with three different things, viruses, bacteria, and fungi. So paradoxically, it turns out that all of us and everything you see around you in this entire planet or nature are the children of viruses, bacteria, and fungi, which is why I think this whole pandemic thing with the virus scares such a joke, because if they actually knew how many viruses were in their body and all their time and what they're for, they would, they would realize we're being totally scammed. But most people are just too undereducated to know when they're being lied to. <laughs> but so what happened was, is as I was working through all this literature and studying and I typically would take the references of any good chapter or research paper and I would have my assistant pull all those uh, resources. And, and so I would track each author's resources. Inevitably, I came across a couple mentions of rotation dieting. And at that time, there was only two little tiny books I could find anywhere in the world on it. But basically, what I found is that the concept of the rotation diet is directly linked to the concept of the exclusion diet, which to this very day is the gold standard for determining what someone has for food allergies and food intolerances. But the physiological basis of a rotation diet is that any food molecule you eat takes about 72, roughly 72 to 76 hours to leave the body, and it's affecting the immune system and the physiology of the body until it leaves your rectum. So from mouth to anus, there is some potential effect of any food molecule. So the concept of the rotation diet says we have to rotate our foods on at least a four-day cycle because that gives the immune system and the body a rest from any potentially offensive molecule for 24 hours, during which time the immune system calms and the, and the body's healing mechanism can clean up all the inflammation that was created by whatever was inflaming the body. Then the next concept is you, in order to keep the body from being re-exposed to antigens that have the same genes in them, you have to rotate foods based on taxonomic groups that do not share genetics. So for example, if you're eating chicken today and duck tomorrow and ostrich the next day and quail the next day, as far as your immune system's concerned, you've eaten the same thing every day. Hey guys, and that's it for part one of this podcast. It's at this point that we begin to really have some internet troubles, but don't worry, Paul, Chuck, and I are going to be back in the next week or two with part two, where we're going to dive a lot deeper into rotation diets and a whole lot more. So don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, share this podcast around and get ready for part two. Thank you guys. As always, we'll see you next time.